Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And you've joined us uh, this week for the first Sunday of Lent, which is February 26, 2023. Our text today is Matthew 18, uh, verses 15 through 35. And uh, it really fits coming out of Ash Wednesday, where um, we um, kind of ended on that, that low note of, of judgment um, and uh, talked about, uh, you know, what really uh, gets Jesus and God upset. But before we really look at this question of forgiveness, I want to take a look at the translation that uh, we're using the New Revised Standard and uh, particularly in verse 15 and again in 21. Um, the word is translated church, and in actuality, the word is um, brother, brethren, uh, which was an inclusive term back then. Um, and the reason that I that, uh, want to draw your attention to that is when we hear church, which uh, is actually used, ecclesia, is actually used uh, in verse, um, oh, somewhere in the middle. 17, thank you. Um, um, when we use that or when we hear that as church, we kind of think of that as the contemporary denominations, uh, organizations uh, uh, of the you know, post-resurrection. Uh, um, but that word actually means community. It means assembly. It means gathered group. Um, so it could mean brothers and sisters, uh, which is often the language that Paul uses uh, and ecclesia is the word Paul uses in his letters. So when we're reading this, if we're reading from a translation that church, uh, that uses church, you just want to have us hear that as our community. And so it fits uh, for the community of Jews, the community of Gentiles, the merged community of Christ followers, whoever our people, our tribe uh, would be. And it addresses, uh, thanks for that, Joy. I think, uh, yeah, it's easy when we hear the word church to think denomination or congregation. And it may be that. I mean, that may be, that is congregation or parish may be your uh, community. Um, but it addresses this perennial problem, right? <laughs> the, I think Brueggemann, uh, in his commentary on Genesis, Walter Brueggemann talks about the problem of the brother. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's a perennial problem, right? Like, if, if it was just me and Jesus, everything would be hunky-dory. But I have to deal with you, right? And you have to deal with me. And it's not always hunky-dory, right? <laughs> there, are, there are feelings hurt. There are wrongs done. Um, sometimes very serious wrongs, as we uh, mentioned uh, in uh, in the Ash Wednesday broadcast. But sometimes just human sin, right? Just just um, disregarding each other or not uh, not taking care of one another as we should in the assembly. And so, what do you do? Like, what do you do with the problem of the brother or the problem of the sister? What do you do when you have to live with real? Flesh and blood human beings, uh, and and uh, and and such hurt can be particularly bad when it's you know our our brothers and sisters in Christ, where we think that everything should always be you know light and rainbows and uh, you know love and and uh, and such, right? Uh, what do what do we do when we piss each other off, basically? Uh, so, um, first of all. Um, Yes, I'm going through some stuff like that in my own congregation right now that's ringing in my head, but obviously I don't want to talk about. But uh, that is the problem. And so notice it does, there's a threefold step. And this is, um, this is not um, marching orders literally, but it's, it's a sort of a decent sort of process. So if you're, if you're estranged from somebody or, or if something has happened to do, disrupt a relationship is maybe better. Yeah. Talk to them individually. If it's still disrupted, then maybe bring a couple other people in. I, what I don't like about the way sometimes Matthew is interpreted here, it says, take one or two others along with you. In other words, now it's, now it's three to one. Mm -hmm. rather, rather than being three to one, maybe it's rather it's still one on one, but you brought a couple other people in to help you think through the disruption. If that doesn't work, again, maybe a bigger group. And then it says, 
if even then the offender, you have to recall, maybe you're the offender, mm -hmm. okay? Um, let the offender be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. And how does Jesus always regard the Gentile and tax collector as someone that you permanently want to be reconciled with? So you are to regard them not as anathema, but you're to regard them as someone that you really still want to always be reconciled with. I, um, uh, when I speak, and this is going to lead me to the, to the um, ritual practice of passing the peace, uh, in which a lot of congregations do, in, and most in, in liturgical settings do, liturgical, that is, denominations and congregations. We, we ritually pass the peace as a ritual saying, by extending this ritual around me, I'm showing that I'm always willing to be reconciled to my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I teach on this, sometimes I say, you know, I, I work at a seminary and you might not understand, you might not know that even at places where professional Christians work with each other, sometimes relationships go bad mm -hmm. and people come to hate each other. <clears throat> and so talking about how we both do not within the seminary here and do sometimes live up to this vision of to go back to um, the Lenten, the Ash Wednesday story, try to live into this upside down kingdom that God has left us. And in a way that is, uh, that, that always reaches towards reconciliation, that always reaches towards healing of disrupted relationships. So that then it moves on, uh, you know, Peter wants, Peter wants uh, details, right? So Lord, if another member uh, another brother, I think, is actually the uh, the Greek here. If my brother uh, or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. That's that's quite a bit. And Jesus says to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times, or seventy times, seven times, seven times. So, uh, in other words, there's not a limit. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the you you still need to forgive. Uh, is this is Jesus telling us to be doormats? <laughs> I think that's the question that comes up often. Right, right. It, you know, it's an attitude. If you've if you've done something seven times, now seventy times, now seventy times, seven times, it has become a way of life. And that really fits in what Rolf was saying in terms of what, how is Jesus saying your attitude toward the Gentile is to be constantly one of reconciliation. So this is the attitude that is developed after practicing this over and over again. So if we have this attitude of if I'm the one who is the problem or has caused the pain, how would I want folks to receive me with just a little bit more patience? With just a little bit, give me, give me one more chance, which is what happens in the parable that that is next uh, lifted up, is that um, we use this word, and you know, I, I referenced the, the power of words uh, um, in our Ash Wednesday um, uh, podcast, but you know, we use this word where where we talk about the slave, and it has such such imagery for us. And we've been paying attention to how the slave master uh, in our own history has been um, so uh, egregious. Um, but if, if we look at this in the sense of literally what's being written here, it's basically saying that you have this worker. I'm going to tone these words down a little bit. We have these worker who's working for someone and their whole reason for being let me use an old term, an indentured servant is to pay off a debt. And they realize this isn't going to happen. And when, when, when the person who is owed realizes the debt's not going to be paid, they come out and they say, let's make this happen. And the person says, give me another chance. And unlike how modern Western uh, slavery was acted out, the old a way of a payment is being described here in ancient scripture. And it's saying, you know what? I'm going to give you grace. Not only am I going to give you another chance, I'm going to wipe out the debt. And then the story goes on to say, having received this grace, having been forgiven, 
regained your freedom. What do you do? You go and you treat someone worse than you've been treated. And that is a tremendous problem. And I think if we don't read the story that far down, we don't realize that what is really being told here is an example of, how is it in the prayer? Forgive me as I've forgiven others. This is a repeat of what will, will be that prayer of how, how do we expect to be forgiven by God, but by the way that we forgive others. This is a powerful, uh, powerful parable in this way. I was going to make that exact connection uh, back to the liturgy. Um, and that, that prayer is introduced early in the Sermon on the Mount, which we uh, treated extensively uh, during the Epiphany season. What does it mean to be part of the upside-down kingdom? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Um, that's, the, that's the problem with the book of Jonah. Jonah likes the God of grace as long as the grace is extended towards Israel. He doesn't like it extended towards Assyria. And... Are we able to forgive others as we have been forgiven? That is the discipline of Lent, living into the one who has forgiven us. Yeah, and the, the debt here, as I'm sure all of our listeners are aware, is, is hugely disproportional, right? To say 10,000 talents, it, it's an impossible debt. Like, how, how in the world does this indentured servant even accumulate such a debt. It's a, it's a ridiculous kind of figure. Um, but it shows the extravagant forgiveness, the extravagant love, uh, the extravagant mercy uh, of God uh, that, that that debt is forgiven. And then for, and because it's so extravagant, then the, the, uh, what the, the selfishness of that servant than to not forgive uh, his fellow servant is all the more striking. Uh, so it's it, it sounds uh, harsh at the end, right? So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. There's a, uh, the, it again, sounds harsh. Uh, and it is. It's a word of judgment. And, and it's, I like how you put it, Joy, it's the, it's that habit. It's that way of life that we, you know, if we practice, if, as you said, Rolf, it, that Lenten discipline of forgiving uh, and of reconciliation, uh, if we, you know, by the grace of God, if we practice that, it uh, hopefully becomes part of us so that it's a natural thing to forgive those uh, fellow servants, those fellow disciples of Jesus. Let me throw in one last comment uh, by way of closing. Um, I went to Roman Catholic College and uh, uh, loved it there. And one of the things in Lent is almost all of my um, observant Catholic friends gave up something for Lent. Mm -hmm. How about this? How about you give up all your grudges? Ooh. How about you give up all the things you've been holding against your neighbor? And they're literal. I mean, they're they're not just like little things, but they're real things. What would that be like by way of forgiving others? 